Hello, everyone. Just to let you know, uh, we'll start the presentation in less than a minute. We're just waiting for everyone to get in and get settled. Everyone, just to let you know, we'll start the presentation in less than 30 seconds. We're just uh, still waiting for people to get in and get settled. Hello everyone and welcome to today's safety and health webcast, OSHA training for general industry, reviewing the elements for select topics, sponsored by JJ Keller. My name is Alan Ferguson, I'm an associate editor with safety and health, and I will moderate today's session. Thank you for joining us and we hope you are all safe and well wherever you are today. This is our first webinar of 2022 and we hope you're having a great year so far. In a few minutes, we'll start the presentation, but first let's review some housekeeping items. The views of today's speakers and organizations are their own and do not necessarily affect those of the National Safety Council or Safety and Health Magazine. Any mention of a commercial enterprise, product, or publication does not mean the council or the magazine endorses those items. At the end of today's webcast, we'll conduct a question and answer session. To ask a question, simply, simply click the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, type your question, and click the send button. Feel free to ask your question at any time during this presentation. You don't have to wait for the Q&A to begin. We'll try to answer as many questions as possible, but because of the large number of participants today, we might not get to every question. The good news is that any unanswered questions will be forwarded to today's sponsor. And at the, also at the end of this webcast, you'll be asked to complete a brief evaluation survey, and I will let you know more about that after this presentation. Just to let you know, this webcast is archived, so you can access it after today's live event to view this webcast and all of our past webcasts. Please go to safetyandhealthmagazine.com slash events. With that, let's go ahead and get started. With us today are Rachel Krupsack and Robin Marth. Rachel writes a monthly newsletter on employee safety training and manages a pair of publications, Hazard Communication Compliance and OSHA Rules for General Industry. Her topics of expertise include training requirements, hearing conservation, bloodborne pathogens, emergency action plans, and hazard communication. Robin joined J.J. Keller this past year as an editor and is an EHS specialist with experience in the management consulting and manufacturing industry. Her topics of expertise include safety and health programs, training, workplace safety administration, ergonomics, environmental management, and sustainability. She holds an ASP and CSP designation from the Board of Certified Safety Professionals and is an OSHA Outreach General Industry Trainer. Once again, we thank you all for tuning in. And Rachel, whenever you're ready, go ahead and take it away. Okay, thank you. And hello, everyone. Today's webcast is presented by JJ Keller's newest addition to our growing family of world-class EHS solutions. Tackle tomorrow's problems today with the JJ Keller Safety Management Suite. This ready resource provides round-the-clock access to all of JJ Keller's most popular safety management tools, making it easy to develop a full-service safety program from the ground up. On behalf of JJ Keller Safety Management Suite, thank you for joining us. So let's get started. One of the most challenging areas for any environmental health and safety or EHS professional is safety training. It's a big concern and employers have a lot of questions. This webcast will attempt to answer some of those questions. We'll first show you where to find OSHA training regulations for general industry, and then we'll touch on state training requirements, or regulations and requirements. We'll explore the risks of non-compliance. Finally, we'll discuss seven key general industry training topics, including bloodborne pathogens, hazard communication, forklifts, occupational noise exposure, lockout tagout, walking working surfaces, and portable fire extinguishers. For each of these topics, we'll go over who needs training and provide an overview of the training elements. There's no one size fits all OSHA regulation or requirement when it comes to training. Many OSHA standards include explicit safety and health training requirements. Some of these standards require training or instruction. Others require adequate or effective training or instruction, and still others require training in a manner or in language that is understandable to employees. Regardless of the precise regulatory language, 
These requirements reflect OSHA's belief that training is an essential part of every employer's safety and health program. The first place to look for training requirements is in the OSHA federal standards. This is the first of four slides listing general industry regulations with training requirements. You may fall under any number of these regulations. As we walk through the next several slides pointing out well over 70 general industry regulations with training requirements, don't get too overwhelmed. While these regulations have training requirements, it's likely that not all of them apply to you. If the regulation doesn't apply to work that your employees are performing, you don't need to train on that topic. Here, access to employee exposure and medical records is highlighted in red because we wanted to bring an important detail to your attention. According to paragraph G of 1910-1020, when an employee first enters employment and annually thereafter, you must inform them of the existence, location, and availability of any employee exposure and medical records, who's responsible for maintaining and providing access to those records, and the employee's rights of access to these records. And with that, I will turn it over to Robin. Thank you, Rachel. Okay, so here are some more training requirements. We've highlighted the regulation for injury and illness record keeping. While you know you have to keep records of employee injuries and illnesses, you may not know that the regulation requires you to inform employees about the following, how they are to report a work-related injury or illness to you, your procedure for reporting work-related injuries and illnesses, that employees have the right to report work-related injuries and illnesses, and that you are prohibited from discharging or in any manner discriminating against employees for reporting work-related injuries and illnesses. Now on this next slide, note that the fire extinguisher training requirement is highlighted. A frequent question we get on fire extinguisher training is whether employees must have hands-on training. If you have employees who are designated to use fire extinguishers in the event of an emergency, those employees must receive annual hands-on training. And we'll talk more about that in, later on in our presentation. Another question we are frequently asked is whether there's an annual training requirement for telecommunications. Now the regulations don't have an annual training requirement, but OSHA would expect you to provide refresher training if an employee was not using safe work practices or otherwise appeared to need additional training. On this next slide, we've listed all of the toxic and hazardous substances that have training elements uh, 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 available. These are found in subpart Z of 29 CFR 1910. So in looking at this slide, if you have any of these substances, you do have training requirements. In addition to the federal OSHA standards, which you must comply with, many states and territories have been approved by OSHA to operate their own safety and health programs. These state plan states must have standards that are at least as effective as OSHA's rules, but they may have additional requirements that could involve employee training. If you're in one of these state plan states, you'll need to meet the training requirements in your state. Many of these states adopt federal OSHA rules as is, but this isn't always the case. When it comes to training, what are the risks of noncompliance? No one wants to be out of compliance, but if you're ever tempted to cut costs by sidetracking training, consider the consequences. If you don't provide training, you're at risk for some large OSHA fines. Training violations are typically cited as serious violations which carry a fine of $13,494 each. A serious violation is defined by OSHA as one in which there is substantial probability that death or serious physical harm could result and the employer knew or should have known of the hazard. Another risk of noncompliance is a workplace injury, illness, or fatality. When an employee isn't sure of what they are doing, they have an increased risk for injury or illness. Injuries and illnesses come with costs that are likely to be higher than OSHA fines. 
Some direct costs may include medical bills, repairs to any damaged equipment, product losses, and costs to hire and train replacement workers. You'll also want to consider potential indirect costs, such as decreased morale and productivity in coworkers, increases in your workers' compensation premiums, and lost business contracts due to having a higher experience modification rate. In addition, your reputation in the community and industry can take a hit if the injury, illness, or fatality is publicized. Rachel, I'll pass it back to you. Okay, here's the first of seven training topics we're going to cover. As noted on the slide, the training requirements for bloodborne pathogens are found at 1910-1030 paragraph G2. First, who needs to be trained? The regulations say that all employees with occupational exposure to bloodborne pathogens need to be trained. So what constitutes occupational exposure? This is defined in the regulations as reasonably anticipated skin, eye, mucous membrane or parenteral contact with blood or other potentially infectious materials that may result from the performance of, a, of an employee's duties. While healthcare immediately springs to mind as an occupation with occupational exposure, this definition could encompass a variety of jobs that you may not have considered. First aiders, housekeepers, maintenance workers, security personnel, or any others have occupational exposure by definition. The bloodborne pathogen standard is not meant solely for employees in healthcare settings. Employees must be trained prior to initial occupational exposure to bloodborne pathogens, at least annually thereafter, and when there are changes such as modifications of tasks or procedures, or institution of new tasks or procedures, which affect the employee's exposure. This additional training may be limited to addressing the new exposures created. And what about temporary workers? Temporary workers may be at risk for exposure to bloodborne pathogens in many professions, including, but not limited to, nursing and other healthcare work, housekeeping in some industries, and emergency response. In its Temporary Workers Initiative, TWI Bulletin 6, OSHA says that both the host and the staffing agency are responsible for ensuring that temporary employees are properly protected against bloodborne pathogens. However, the employers may jointly review the task assignments and job hazards to determine a division of compliance responsibilities. The host employer typically is responsible for providing site-specific bloodborne pathogens training. The staffing agency whose employees have reasonably anticipated occupational exposure to blood or OPIM is responsible for providing generic bloodborne pathogen information and training, ensuring that the temporary workers are provided with the required vaccinations and follow-up providing proper post-exposure evaluation and follow-up after an exposure incident, and retaining applicable medical and training records. So what topics need to be covered in bloodborne pathogens training? The regulations have quite a list, so let's unpack it. First, employees must have access to a copy of the bloodborne pathogen standard and an explanation of its contents. A qualified trainer must provide a general explanation of the epidemiology and symptoms of blood bloodborne diseases, as well as explanations on the following. How bloodborne pathogens are transmitted, your exposure control plan and how employees can get a copy of it, the appropriate methods for recognizing tasks and other activities that may involve exposure to blood and other potentially infectious materials, and the use and limitations of methods that will prevent or reduce exposure, including appropriate engineering practices, work practices, and personal protective equipment, or PPE. Explanations also must be given on the basis for selection of PPE, the procedures to follow if an exposure incident occurs, including the method of reporting the incident and the medical follow-up that will be made available, and the signs and labels and or color coding required in paragraph G1 of 1910-1030. These relate to communicating hazards to employees. Robin? Excellent, Rachel. Let's continue on with this topic. Okay, so the regulations also say that information must be provided on the following topics. The types, proper use, location, removal, handling, decontamination, and disposal of the PPE, and the hepatitis B vaccine, including information on how effective it is, its safety, the method of administration, 
the benefits of being vaccinated and that the vaccine will be offered free of charge. In addition, training also must include information about the appropriate actions to take and persons to contact in an emergency involving blood or other potentially infectious materials and the post exposure evaluation and follow up that you the employer are required to provide for the employee following an exposure incident. Additional initial training is required for employees in HIV and HBV laboratories and production facilities. This training must be in addition to the training requirements we listed in the previous slides and details can be found in the bloodborne pathogen standard. While most regulations do not address how the training must be presented, the bloodborne pathogen standard contains a number of requirements on this point. First, training must be provided at no cost to employees and during working hours. Second, the training must contain material that's appropriate in content and vocabulary to the educational level, literacy, and language of the employees in the training. All trainees must be able to understand it. Third, it must include the opportunity for interactive questions and answers with the trainer. And fourth, it must be conducted by a person knowledgeable in the subject matter covered by the elements contained in the training program as it relates to the workplace that the training will address. In addition to demonstrating expertise in the area of the occupational hazard of bloodborne pathogens, the trainer must be familiar with the manner in which the elements in the training program relate to the particular workplace. Possible trainers include a variety of healthcare professionals, but also non-healthcare professionals, such as industrial hygienists or professional trainers. While OSHA's regulations do not always include a requirement for training records, bloodborne pathogens is one regulation that does. It says employers must keep training records and maintain them for three years from the date on which the training occurred. The training records must contain the following information, the date or dates of the training sessions, contents or a summary of the training sessions, names and qualifications of the person or persons conducting the training, and names and job titles of all persons attending the training sessions. The regulations also specify that the training records be made available upon request for both examination and copying to employees, employee representatives, and OSHA. That concludes this topic and I will send it back to Rachel. Okay, thank you. Next, let's look at hazard communication. Hazard communication or HAZCOM is regularly found in OSHA's list of top 10 violations and training or a lack thereof is often cited as a reason for the violation. The training requirements are found at 1910-1200 paragraphs H and J and cover a lot of ground. First, the regulation says that employees with exposure or potential exposure to hazardous chemicals must be trained. So what does this mean and who does it include? Under the HASCOM rule, exposure or exposed means that an employee is subjected to a hazardous chemical in the course of employment through any route of entry, such as in inhalation, ingestion, skin contact, or absorption, and includes potential, that is, accidental or possible exposure. Information and training may be designed to cover categories of hazards like flammability or carcinogenicity or specific chemicals. Chemical specific information must always be available through labels and safety data sheets or SDSs. Employees must be trained at the time of initial assignment prior to initial exposure and whenever a new chemical hazard is introduced. There is no annual training requirement. The HASCOM standard does not set requirements for specific refresher training. However, if employees are not putting into practice what was covered in training, it's time to revisit training to ensure their safety. 
employers often wonder if HASCOM training applies to temporary workers. The answer is yes. OSHA has issued citations to host employers for lack of site-specific training. The host employer can contract out to the staffing agency to provide general training, but the host must provide site-specific training. The host employer is the one who controls conditions, potential hazards, and directs the workers' activities around and exposure to those hazards. In a TWI bulletin regarding temporary workers and HASCOM, OSHA says, the host employer holds the primary responsibility for providing site-specific hazard communication information and training on chemical hazards in the workplace to temporary employees, since it uses or produces the hazardous chemicals and creates and controls the work process. The host employer is therefore best suited to inform employees of the chemical hazards specific to the workplace environment through site-specific training. The HASCOM training provided to temporary workers must be identical or equivalent to that given to the host's own employees performing the same or similar work. Training must cover what's on a label, which includes product identifiers, signal words, pictograms, hazard statements, and precautionary statements. How employees might use labels in the workplace, such as for determining safe storage practices, how label elements work, the format of the SDS, which contains 16 standardized sections, how the label information relates to SDS information, and if you have material safety data sheets or MSDSs for any chemicals that you use, you must train employees how to read them. And back to Robin. Perfect. Okay, so let's continue on with has common training requirements. Now, employees also must be trained on the following the methods and observations that may be used to detect the presence or release of a hazardous chemical in the work area, such as monitoring conducted by the employer, continuous monitoring devices, or visual appearance or odor of hazardous chemicals when being released, the physical health, simple asphyxiation, combustible dust, and pyrophoric gas hazards, as well as hazards not otherwise classified of the chemicals in the work area, the measures employees can take to protect themselves from these hazards, including specific procedures you have implemented to protect employees from exposure to hazardous chemicals, such as appropriate work practices, emergency procedures, and PPE to be used, and the details of the HASCOM program you've developed, including an explanation of the labels received on shipped containers and the workplace labeling system you use. Now the SDS, including the order of information and how employees can obtain and use the, the appropriate hazard information. The regulations don't specify requirements for the trainer, but OSHA expects that he or she would have the knowledge and understanding to present the information so that it's understandable to all employees and that it's specific to the workplace. OSHA's CPL 02-02-079 says that if employees do not speak English and are given work instructions in another language, the training must be provided in that language. Likewise, if employees have low literacy, training must be provided so they can understand it. For example, for example verbal instruction versus reading documents. Regarding multi-employer work sites, OSHA CPL says the employer is responsible for providing updated training when their employees are exposed to new hazards, even if these hazards are created by other employers. While the HASCOM regulations do not require training records, it is a best practice to maintain some record of employees' training. This way, you know who's been trained and when, and you can keep your training program organized. Training records are also a good way to prove to an inspector that you've complied with the regulations. Consider including the employee's name, the date of the training, the name of the trainer, and the topic that was covered. HASCOM continues to be one of the most challenging areas for safety professionals. 
If you'd like to ac like access to the free HASCOM training content, the JJ Keller Safety Management Suite offers hundreds of award-winning training programs and thousands of customizable training resources, including PowerPoint presentations, five-minute safety talks, classroom exercises, quizzes, and more. Use the poll to select your interests. And along with access to free compliance resources and tools in the site, we'll also email you a digital copy of our white paper on top EHS practices. All right, so while you're making your selection, let's take a question. Rachel, how about you taking one for us? Okay, um, we have a question here that asks, are physical copies of SDSs required on site or in a book? Um, you can either have them, you can have them online, you can electronically, you can have them in a binder, um, as long as you have employees would have ready access to those or and also in the event of a power outage or something, you'd also want to have them in a probably in a hard copy so that if there were an emergency that medical personnel could get to those in that case as well. And now we'll head back to the presentation here. We'll move on to powered industrial trucks or PITs. So PITs includes include <coughs> excuse me, forklifts, powered pallet jacks, stand-up rider lift trucks, order pickers, and the like. In fact, that's one major compliance issue. Some employers have failed to train operators on all the types of PIT equipment they operate. Even powered pallet jacks require training under 1910-178, and that training needs to be equipment specific. You don't necessarily have to train each operator on every pallet jack made by different manufacturers, but OSHA does prohibit allowing an operator who only has forklift training to operate a powered pallet jack without additional training. The training must be for each type of equipment. Also, employees must be trained prior to operating a vehicle without direct supervision. OSHA requires that refresher training be conducted under certain circumstances. There's no set frequency, but you do need to retrain when there's an accident or near miss, when the operator is observed operating unsafely, when the operator is assigned to drive a different type of truck, when a condition in the workplace changes in a way that could affect safe operation of the truck or when an evaluation reveal, reveals deficiencies. Aside from refresher training, OSHA requires all operators to undergo a performance evaluation at least once every three years. So what about temporary employees? OSHA's TWI Bulletin 7 says that generally, the staffing agency is responsible for generic PIT training and the host employer is in the best position to provide the necessary site-specific PIT training and evaluation, as the host employer is most familiar with the equipment being used and controls the conditions of the work site. The training and evaluation should be the same as that provided to the host employer's own employees in the same jobs. If the staffing agency supplies trained PIT operators, the host employer must verify that training and that training and provide site-specific information and training on the particular types of trucks and working conditions present at the work site. The host employer must also conduct a workplace evaluation of each operator supplied by the staffing agency. The extent of the training and evaluation provided by the host is based upon the operator's past experience and may not need to be duplicated or as extensive as the initial training and evaluation. OSHA says that if the staffing agency is providing trained PIT operators, it may be in the best position to keep training and evaluation records. In these cases, the host employer may choose, but is not required, to maintain or store additional copies of the PIT training records of temporary workers. However, OSHA notes that the host employer must know where the training and evaluation records are located, and they must be accessible to an OSHA compliance officer during an inspection. As a recommended practice, the host employer and staffing agency may agree to share training records to ensure both parties are able to verify that the training is completed. OSHA's requirements are performance oriented to permit employers to tailor a training program to the characteristics of their workplaces and the particular types of powered industrial trucks operated. The regulations outline specific truck related topics that must be covered. These include, include the items listed on the slide. 
In a 1999 letter of interpretation, OSHA answered a question on whether truck-related training has to be weight and brand specific. They said that training isn't based on weight or brand, but instead on whether the, tr the trucks that an employee may operate differ with respect to any one or more of the truck-related topics outlined in the standard. The regulations also outline workplace-specific topics listed on the slide. In a 1999 letter of interpretation, OSHA said that whether an operator trained and evaluated at one of an employer's facilities must receive additional training at another facility on workplace-related topics depends on whether the two facilities significantly differ with respect to any one or more of these topics. If all of the potential hazards addressed in the workplace-related topics are the same, then no additional training or evaluation would be necessary. For example, where all of an employer's facilities have substantially similar ramps or narrow aisles, no additional training on those topics would be required. However, additional training would be required if the loads to be carried at different facilities significantly differ in composition or stability. Robin? Awesome, thank you, Rachel. So continuing on with PITs, not all regulations have requirements for conducting training, but according to 1910.178 is a standard that does. According to the regulations, training must consist of a combination of formal instruction. So whether that be lecture, discussion, interactive computer learning, videotape, written material, practical training, those could be demonstrations performed by the trainer and uh, practice exercises performed by the trainee and evaluation of the operator's performance in the workplace. The regulations also address duplicative PIT training. There's no need for additional training in a specific topic if an operator has previously received training on it. It's appropriate to the truck and working conditions encountered and the operator has been evaluated and found competent to operate the truck safely. So what about trainer qualifications? Now the regulation says only that the trainer must have knowledge, training, and experience necessary to conduct the training. OSHA has said they left this intentionally performance oriented, believing that the necessary qualification could be obtained in a variety of ways whether that be through years of operating a PIT and knowledge of safe practices and OSHA regulations pertaining to the operation, going to a train the trainer or similar course, and or some combination of experience and training. The only specific criteria OSHA lays out is found in a 2003 letter of interpretation. It says that the trainer must have at some point operated the type of equipment they are training potential operators on so that they can provide adequate instruction to trainees on how the equipment works, feels, et cetera. In other words, a worker may not simply watch a training video and read the forklift regulation and then be qualified to conduct training. You, the employer, are left to designate someone you feel comfortable can convey the safe operation principles in an understandable manner and will ensure that operators do in fact have the proper skill and knowledge before signing off on the certification. Be prepared to state your case to OSHA as to why the person you've chosen is a suitable trainer. What about documentation and training records? You must certify that each PIT operator has been trained and evaluated as required by the regulations. The certification must include the name of the operator, the date of the training and evaluation, and the identity of the person performing the training or evaluation. Well, that does it for PITs. Rachel, back to you. All right, thank you. So now let's address occupational noise exposure. The training requirements for this standard are found in 1910-95 paragraph K. First, let's talk about who needs to be trained. The regulation says all employees exposed to noise at or above an eight hour time-weighted average or TWA of 85 decibels, even if the employee is exposed to this level for only one day, need to be trained. Training must be provided initially prior to noise exposure and repeated annually. 
refresher training must take place if there are changes to hearing protection or work processes. And what about temporary employees? OSHA's TWI Bulletin 9 says that while a staffing agency and the host employer share the responsibility for temporary workers, the host employer is most familiar with and has control over the processes and equipment that may produce hazardous noise levels that the temporary workers will encounter, and therefore is in the best position to train them. OSHA expects this training to be equivalent to what the host employer's own employees receive. So what topics need to be covered in training? The regulations say that the following topics must be covered. The effects of noise on hearing, which may include a discussion of how long-term exposure leads to hearing loss or that hearing loss is permanent, et cetera. The purpose of hearing protectors, the advantages, disadvantages, and attenuation of hearing protective devices or HBDs. So an advantage would be that they reduce the force of sound pressure reaching the inner ear. However, a disadvantage is that conversations can be difficult while wearing them. Attenuation is how efficient the HPDs are in reducing noise exposures. Training also must cover selecting, fitting, use, and care of HPDs. This includes a discussion of the variety of types and sizes of HPDs available, that comfort is an important part of getting a good fit when making a selection, when and where to wear HPDs in the workplace, and how to clean HPDs according to manufacturer's instructions. The training also must include a discussion of the purpose of audiometric testing and an explanation of the test procedures. You also must post a copy of 191095 in the workplace and make it available to employees or their representative upon request. While the regulations don't address trainer requirements or the training format, OSHA's publication 3074, Hearing Conservation says, the training program may be structured in any format with different portions conducted by different individuals and at different times, as long as the required topics are covered. While the occupational noise exposure regulations do not require training records, it's a best practice to maintain some record of employees training. This way, you know who's been trained and when, and you can keep your training program organized. Training records also are a good way to provide to prove to an inspector that you've complied with the regulations. Consider including the employee's name, the date of the training, the name of the trainer, and the topic that was covered. Robin? All right, thank you, Rachel. Great information. Now on to one of my favorite topics. Let's talk about lockout tagout. A good lockout tagout program is only as good as the training. OSHA requires you to train employees based on their duties and or exposures depending on whether the employee are considered authorized, affected, or other. Now, authorized employees need the most training and other employees the least. But in all cases, employees must understand the purpose and function of your energy control program. Authorized employees, they're the ones that are doing the servicing, the maintenance, and the repair. They apply the locks or tags and follow the lockout tagout procedures. Affected employees operate or use a machine. Now when a machine is down for servicing or maintenance, the employee can't run it so he or she is affected by the equipment being locked out. Affected employees don't do any service or maintenance work and have to stay clear of the equipment during repairs. And lastly, other employees are those whose work activities are or may be in the area where energy control procedures may be used. Now that we've described the three types of employees, let's talk about their levels of training. Authorized employees need the most detailed training. They must be trained to recognize hazardous energy sources, the type and magnitude of the energy available in the workplace, and they must know how to isolate equipment from its energy sources. Affected employees should be trained to recognize a machine malfunction and know how to report the, pro the problem to authorized employees. Other employees must be instructed about the lockout tagout procedure and about the prohibition relating to attempts to restart or re-energize machines or equipment which are locked or tagged out. 
OSHA expects temporary workers to receive the same training as permanent employees. In its TWI Bulletin 10, OSHA states that the host employer is responsible for ensuring that if a temporary worker is performing activities covered by the lockout tagout standard, the worker is properly trained and understands the lockout tagout policies and procedures. When tagout is used, authorized, affected, and other employees must be trained in the following limitations of tags. They're essentially warning devices and do not provide the physical restraint that a lock does. Tags are not to be removed without permission of the authorized person responsible for them and should never be bypassed, ignored, or otherwise defeated. And they may evoke a false sense of security. Employees also must be instructed that tags must be legible and understandable by all authorized, affected, and other employees in order to be effective that they are made of materials which will withstand the environmental conditions encountered in the workplace and securely attached to the energy isolating device so they can't be inadvertently or accidentally detached during use. Employees must be trained initially or prior to performing service or maintenance on equipment or a system as needed for employee proficiency and when there are new or revised procedures. There is no annual training requirement for lockout tagout. Rachel, I'll send it back to you. Okay. The lockout tagout standard requires training documentation. Specifically, the regulation says that you must certify that employee training has been accomplished and is being kept up to date. The certification must contain the employee's name and the dates of the training. So now let's talk about walking working surfaces. You must train employees who use personal fall protection systems, including fall arrest, travel restraint, and positioning devices, and equipment such as ladders of all types, ladder safety systems, portable guardrails, designated areas, scaffolds, safety net systems, and rope descent systems. While OSHA hasn't issued a TWI bulletin specific to walking working surfaces, TWI Bulletin 4 provides general training guidance related to temporary employees. It says temporary workers are entitled to the same protections under the OSH Act as all other covered workers and that the host employer is usually responsible for site-specific training because it's in the best position to provide such training. Back to you, Robin. All right, so keeping with walking working surfaces, Employees must be trained before initially being assigned to a job where they may be exposed to a fall hazard. They must be retrained when you observe that they don't have the understanding or skills to safely perform their job, or there are changes in the workplace or fall protection systems or equipment requires it. The regulations say that training must be understandable. You must provide information and training in a manner that the employee understands. Training must be conducted by a qualified person. So what does that mean? The regulations at 1910.21 define it as a person who has a degree, certificate, or professional standing, or extensive knowledge, training, and experience to solve or resolve problems relating to the subject matter. For example, how to use fall protection, designated areas, ladder safety systems, uh, the work such as working on a roof or the project. Now trainers do not have to possess a degree if they have the necessary knowledge, training and experience to be qualified to train. Employees must be trained in at least the following topics. The nature of fall hazards in the work area and how to recognize them. The procedures to be followed to minimize those hazards. The correct procedures for installing, inspecting, operating, 
maintaining and disassembling the personal fall protection systems that the employee uses and the correct use of personal fall protection systems and equipment, including but not limited to proper hookup, anchoring and tie off techniques and the methods of equipment inspection and storage as specified by the manufacturer. There is no requirement to keep records under 1910.30. However, it is a best practice to keep a record of all safety and health training. Rachel, how about our last topic? All right, and so finally, let's talk about portable fire extinguishers. The regulations at 1910.157 paragraph G discuss who needs to be trained. If you have portable fire extinguishers for employee use and or you have designated certain employees to use firefighting equipment as part of your emergency action plan, those employees must be trained on how to use the fire extinguishers. However, you do not need to provide fire extinguisher training in the following situations. First, maybe you if you require total evacuation of employees from the workplace immediately when the alarm sounds, no one is authorized to use available portable ex fire extinguishers or fire extinguishers are not provided. While in this case, you do not have to provide fire extinguisher training, you do have to establish an emergency action plan and fire prevention plan that meet the requirements of 1910-38 and 1910-39. In the second situation, you keep portable fire extinguishers in the workplace, but do not want employees fighting fires and therefore evacuate them to safety. Again, in this case, you do not have to provide hands-on fire extinguisher training. However, you do have to establish an emergency action plan and fire prevention plan that meet the requirements of 1910-38 and 1910-39. In this situation, only the maintenance, inspection, and testing requirements found in 1910-157 apply. While OSHA hasn't issued a TWI bulletin specific to portable fire extinguishers, TWI Bulletin 4 provides general training guidance related to temporary employees. It says temporary workers are entitled to the same protections under the OSH Act as all other covered workers, and that the host employer is usually responsible for site-specific training because it's in the best position to provide such training. The regulations require employees to be trained upon initial employment and at least annually thereafter. This applies in situations where fire extinguishers are provided for employee use in the workplace and for employees who have been designated to use firefighting equipment as part of an emergency action plan. Robin? All right, a lot of good information. Now stay with me for just a little bit more. Hands-on training is required for all employees who are expected and or designated to use fire extinguishers in the event of an emergency. In addition, you must provide an educational program that familiarizes employees with the general principles of fire extinguisher use and the hazards involved with incipient stage firefighting. In a 1986 letter of interpretation, OSHA says that in meeting the requirements of the standard, you may provide educational materials without classroom instruction through the use of employee notice campaigns using instruction sheets or flyers or similar types of informational programs, or provide on-site training which exposes employees to the actual feeling of a firefighting by simulated fires for training employees in the proper use of extinguishers. The letter also says that employers must understand that when they permit employees to fire workplace fires, they must make sure that the employees know whatever is necessary to ensure their safety. In light of this, you have some leeway to determine what to include in your training. You'll want to address the types of fires that employees may encounter in your workplace, as well as safe extinguisher use. In terms of safe extinguisher use, the first step is for the employee to evaluate whether the fire can be put out using a portable fire extinguisher. And only trained employees should make this determination. Instruct your employees to do the following. Know what types of materials are burning and ensure that they are using the correct type of fire extinguisher for that fire. Consider the possible danger posed by hazardous or highly flammable materials. 
always have an unobstructed route away from the fire and use proper techniques for extinguishing small fires such as pass, which hopefully we all know is the pull, aim, squeeze, sweep method. There is no requirement to keep records under 1910.157 However, it is a best practice to keep a record of all safety and health training. Okay, so today we've covered seven topics with training requirements found in the regulations. While we have covered a lot of ground, we hope that you've taken away a better understanding of what OSHA requires. We've directed you to regulations, temporary worker initiative bulletins, and other guidance that should support your compliance efforts. We're getting ready to launch a poll now. Um, in that time, we are going to get to your questions in a moment, but I do want to first, uh, excuse me, I do want to address a few inquiries that have come in regarding the JJ Keller Safety Management Suite. Gain access to hundreds of award-winning training programs and thousands of customizable training resources, including PowerPoint presentations, five-minute safety talks, classroom exercises, quizzes, and more. In addition, you can create custom safety plans, ask our in-house experts compliance questions, and much more. If you'd like free access to our compliance tools and resources in Safety Management Suite, use the poll to select your interests. And again, we'll also send you our white paper, Top EHS Practices. Now let's move on to some questions that have come in. Well, thank you so much, Rachel and Robin. Um, before we start the q and I wanna remind everyone about the evaluation survey we're asking you to complete. The survey will open in a different screen after this webinar. And your input is important because it'll help us improve our future webcast. And now let's get to some questions and we've gotten a number of them. So thank you all very much. Uh, the first one, is there a standard format for SDS inventory? Um, there's, there's not, you can keep that however you would like. If you wanna keep it in electronic access or a hard copy, um, whatever works best, you can keep it um, you know, for SDS is for the entire company, or you could organize it just by work area, specific to the chemicals that are used in one area. So basically kind of whatever works best for the situation you have at your company. So our next question, how often do we have to conduct HAZCOM training? Is it annual or is it just the initial training only? Um, you need to do the initial training. There's no annual requirement, but certainly if you have changes, if you get new chemicals in or new hazards or if, um, the workers, tasks or duties would change that would affect chemical use, you would need to train in those situations, but you don't have to train annually. So our next question, I live in California, we recently had a safety audit and they asked for HAZCOM training records. Is that just a California requirement or is that a national requirement? Hmm, I'm not exactly familiar with California so much. So that might be something that is specific to California. I would have to do a little research on that one. What if your next question, what if your trainer is also an authorized employee? Can the trainer also conduct their own training? Um, Robin, do you have an answer for that one? Um, I'd, I'd have to know a little bit more information on what, which, which training they're, they're speaking of. So we've got another one. Can hands-on fire extinguisher training be completed with laser simulator units or actual extinguishers? That is a new one. Um, you know, I'm not sure. I don't, I've never had that question before. So I would have to do a little research on that one. Rachel, I, I might be able to answer oh, that sure. question. Yeah. Um, I, uh, going back to one of our previous slides, when we talked about simulated fire extinguisher training, there, there are companies that um, can go on site and they, they have, it, it looks like a big light panel um, and they'll have a fire extinguisher that, that, I don't know if it's Bluetooth or however it's tied into that light panel and it will, it will simulate what, what an actual fire looks like. And my understanding is that type of training, don't, you know, again, don't, don't quote me on it without doing extra research, but my understanding is that type of training is allowed um, and would, would suffice for hands-on training um, with those, with those simulated tr type trainings. 
So uh, for bloodborne pathogen, um, is the program required if, if workers use knives or blades as part of their daily tasks, like box cutter or fish filleting? Um, Rachel, unless you want to answer this one, I would say yes, because you're, you're potentially exposing yourself to, to blood, be it from, from your, your person or, um, you know, potentially exposing an addition, you know, somebody else to that, to that infectious material. Rachel, do you have any other thoughts on that? No, I think that that's what I would, how I would answer as well. Okay. So our next question, how long does a facility have to keep its SDS or SDSs to, for, for chemicals no longer in use or ones that are removed? Um, you don't have to necessarily keep them if you're not using them or if they've been removed. The, um, however, you would have to have some record of exposure to that chemical. And I believe those are found in, I want to say it's 1910, 1020, I believe is the medical exposure record. I'm not positive of that number, but um, you'd have to have some record of exposure to a chemical. And I believe those you must keep for 30 years and your SDS could be part of that record, or you can just, it doesn't have to be, you can at least, as long as you have made a note of what the chemical is, when it was used and where it was used in the facility, um, that would be enough. But again, you could save the SDS as part of that if, if that works for you. I'm pretty sure I know the answer to this question, but uh, 3D printing is becoming more common in the workplace. Are there any regulatory requirements? Well, there's nothing specific to, you know, they have, there's no specific 3D printing regulations. Um, so I suppose if there were toxic chemicals that were used in that, that might, there may be something under subpart Z. I'm not particularly familiar with that, or it's certainly under the general duty cause clause, I think. Um, it would depend if there's certain chemicals maybe that would be inhaled or anything like that. So nothing specific to it, but certainly there could be some hazards involved there. So speaking of uh, bloodborne pathogen tender, are employees such as housekeepers, maintenance workers, and janitors in non-healthcare facilities covered by that standard? Well, now OSHA doesn't generally consider all maintenance personnel and janitorial staff employed in non-healthcare facilities to have occupational exposure. So it's the employer's responsibility to determine which job classification or specific tasks or job duties and procedures involve occupational exposure. Um, Rachel, what, what does the training for authorized employees need to cover? Um, that one, I think, let's see, Robin, do you know that off the top of your head? I have to look at that one. Uh, yeah, for, for authorized, it's, it's everything. It's, it's what you're, what's written in your program, how to apply, how to apply the locks, how to remove the locks, what to do if, um, if you have to physically remove a lock due to somebody being being gone or or away from the facility, um, emergency removal of locks, um, they they've got to have everything. And I, I know that's a very short, abbreviated um, response, but I we can provide additional information um, offline when I have a chance to to double check everything. But but authorize they've they've got to they've got to have everything. Um, so when are hazard communication training and retraining required? Um, training initially would be provided before employees that work with chemicals are, or are exposed to chemicals, hazardous chemicals. Um, retraining, there's no specific timeline for that, but that would be, you know, if something changes in the workplace according to their maybe duties or you have new chemical hazards coming in or new, new chemicals in general, um, or if you see that employees aren't acting in a safe manner around chemicals, they don't know how to protect themselves, or they don't, are just generally showing that they're not, they don't know where maybe SDSs are or something like that, then certainly you'd want to have refresher training at that point. And it doesn't have to cover everything that was covered in the first session, but if it's specific, if there's a specific thing you are noticing that they are not doing or understanding, you can just train on that specific topic. Well, thank you so much. Uh, unfortunately, we have run out of time, and I'm sorry we didn't get to everyone's questions, but all of today's unanswered questions we forward to our sponsor. Once again, I hope you take the time to fill out the evaluation survey on your screen to give us your feedback. That ends today's safe. This ends today's Safety and Health Magazine webcast. We'd like to thank Rachel Krupsack, Robin Marth, 
everyone at JJ Keller, and of course, all of you who listen in today. Goodbye and have a safe day.